Hi, welcome to Donna's Intermittent Fasting Journal, broadcast number 34. Um, today's episode is going to be all about leptin, but let me give you a quick update on where my husband and I are in our fasting journey. So um, actually, it was this weekend, one year ago, that my husband began fasting. Now, I started intermittent fasting about... Um, like the first part of November or the last of October of 2017, last year. And many of you have heard my story. I started it because I found out that you can eat whatever you want and still lose weight. Just being honest here, right? So I started because I was tired of trying all the diets, right? And so when I heard that, I was like, I'm all about that. Bring on the sugar, the desserts, all the things that I love, and let me still lose weight. So that is when I began intermittent fasting. And the funny thing about that is that a year later, um, actually quite remarkable, I eat more healthfully one year after being on intermittent fasting in a protocol in which I say no foods are off limits, in a protocol where I do not uh, reduce certain macros. Sometimes I go low carb for a couple of days before I weigh because carbs hold on to water. Sometimes if I have a really carby weekend coming up, I'll go low, low carb a little bit. I have a lot of experience with low carb and with sugar free and all that. So it's not hard for me to do it. Um, sometimes I'll just say, you know, I've got three occasions this weekend. So it's all real foods for the next five days. So I, I do sometimes put little boundaries in place. But the fact that I can do that without any trouble is another amazing thing. <laughs> so I do that sometimes, but I don't really have like, you can only eat so much of this or so many calories or so many carbs or whatever. And yet without, or you, and you can't eat this and you can't eat these food groups and you can't eat these macros and things like that. I have none of those in place. And yet I eat more fruits, more vegetables, better protein, than I did in the previous several years of trying to lose weight with different real stringent restrictions. So I think that's just a, a huge testimony to intermittent fasting and to how uh, it balances your hormones and how you change your eating style over time and how you change your brain so that you get away from such highly processed foods so that you don't have to have those all the time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go into a huge weekend this weekend. I know you guys probably think that's all I ever do is have big weekends, big parties and everything. Um, because I have a big family. And so because of that, you know, I have seven grown adults, ages 20 to 35, and they all live within a half an hour of us. And so every week it feels like something as big is happening for an example in the next eight months or in within a seven seven or eight month period of time one son will have gotten married another son will have gotten engaged uh, another son will have had a baby three sons three children and children-in-law will graduate from different college programs associates masters and doctorate another baby grandbaby will be born and another wedding will take place I mean, our lives are very festive. Yay, yes, right? <laughs> Do you love festive? I love festive. And it took a lot of hard work to get here. Let me tell you, <laughs> raising seven kids was not always festive. But I say all that to say, this weekend coming up, tons of festivities. Friday, a big shopping day. Once a year, I go shopping with friends, and we eat out twice in that day, and it's just a big festive day. The next day, a shower for one of my new grandbabies. That evening, a family decorating party, appetizers, and and uh, uh, Christmas platters and things while we decorate uh, the home, the parents' home for, th for Christmas. And then Sunday, our yearly Christmas dance. My husband and I are in charge of all the desserts, so we have to go get all the pies and all the stuff. So, yeah, I have a lot of festivities going on. And yet, I have still been able to continuously lose weight, two or three pounds every month. My husband loses eight. And I have still been, I've been able to get, gain a sense of control even though I do have festive times. And I just feel like it's all of that 
um, balancing that's taken place through intermittent fasting. So back to my husband's story. Um, his story is that one year ago this Sunday, we are officers of our dance, one of our of one of the dance clubs locally here in Indiana. It's uh, actually south of Fort Wayne a little bit. Is our dance club, and uh, we're officers in it. And so we are in charge of the Christmas dance every year. And so that means that we set it all up and uh, we hire the caterer, we get the DJ and all that kind of stuff. We're ballroom dancers. And then we pick up desserts. I don't bake or anything anymore. I don't keep that kind of stuff in the house very much anymore. Um, so I just buy it for special occasions when I'm making something for the kids or for me if I want something special. But usually there's so many specials, I don't need to add any more specials. So um, a year ago this Sunday was our Christmas dance last December. And we ended up not being able to dance. We went to the dance. We all, we, we danced, you know, a couple times a month and we've danced for 14 years. We're into it and we were into it in a big way. And my husband got out there, his knee was shot. He could not do it. And so we left the dance floor and we, you know, served dessert, set up, served dessert, visited with people, cleaned up, and we never got back on the dance floor that night. And um, we had kind of, Felt like this might happen sometime, but he'd always been able to dance, just dance through the pain. And suddenly he wasn't able to, and especially at the Christmas dance. I mean, who doesn't want to do East Coast Swing to All I Want for Christmas is You? I mean, seriously. It's like the most festive Christmas dancing song there is. And so there we were, unable to dance. And kind of quiet on the way home, you know. He knew he needed to lose weight. He was 120 pounds overweight. And, you know, he knew we, we've been talking forever. You know, he's gone to the knee doctor. He's gotten the injections, put off surgery, put off surgery. You just need to lose weight. I just need to lose weight. He always said, I just need to lose weight. And so he came home that night from the dance, didn't say a whole lot about anything. I've been intermittent fasting for a few weeks now. And the next day he came home from work and said, I didn't eat today. I'm fasting. I'm doing intermittent fasting. Ate dinner a year later, almost 90 pounds down. So, uh, the moral of the story, there are a lot of morals to that story. Some of the morals of that story include, um, one, don't think you cannot begin intermittent fasting during the holidays. You can definitely begin intermittent fasting during the holidays. As a matter of fact, if you were ever going to start a weight management protocol of any kind during the holidays, it should be intermittent fasting. It's the most flexible um, holiday weight management protocol you could possibly follow. I feel like this light is too bright. Let me try to turn that off and see what happens. That's a little better. Okay, and second, the second um, true takeaway from that um, is that uh, intermittent fasting can help you lose a lot of weight. He has about uh, 20, I think we thought he had 25 pounds to go and I had 18. Um, I can't remember. I had already lost weight in a couple of years before that. Um, so I am 18 pounds from my goal and he's like 25 from his goal. But if you are very, very heavy, meaning you don't have over 50, 60, 80 pounds to lose or over 100 like he did, um, intermittent fasting can really, really help you lose weight. Um, and there are other takeaways from that, but I can't remember what all they are. <laughs> So anyway, basically, it's just that intermittent fasting is amazing, and it's doable, completely doable, and it changes you, as we're going to learn today when we talk about leptin. So leptin is a hormone um, that is released from, uh, produced and secreted from fat cells. All right, so I'm going to pull this up here. I kind of, uh, my husband is teaching in my office, so I'm kind of here with a lap desk and so on and so forth. So here, we'll see how this works. Um, it is secreted by uh, fat cells. Now, the interesting thing about leptin, as well as ghrelin, which I talked about in another episode just really pretty recently, um, is that both of these hormones are fairly newly studied. In other words, they're not, they haven't been around, they haven't been known about forever. There were, you know, other, there were different theories about, you know, what, what is that growling in your stomach and what causes you to be hungry and stuff like that as, as in terms of ghrelin. And there were a lot of theories about why um, some people can't seem to stop eating. In spite of being very heavy and having so many, oh, I forgot the rest of that story was that now we can dance all the time. Okay, so 
despite having all of the um, large, large and very filled fat cells, I guess not so large as much as filled, having many filled fat cells, and which would seem to indicate that you have plenty of food, but then why is it that you continue to need more and more and more, you being any of us who were, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight. Um, and so there were a lot of theories about that. And there still are, you know, there's still a lot floating around. And I love reading and researching this stuff. I'm a crazy woman about it. Um, I research and listen and study at least 10 hours every single week uh, to prepare for these broadcasts and um, my upcoming book and so forth. Hi, Pat. So. Anyway, the, but leptin was actually found like in the late 1980s, the early 1990s, and uh, it was found in some like remarkable studies about like grossly obese children actually, and why like a two-year-old or an eight-year-old would, would be so big that they wouldn't be able to walk. And so I'm not gonna go into all those studies right now, but that is actually how ghrelin was first unlocked. I mean, leptin. And that's what we're talking about today. Ghrelin, on the other hand, is even newer. So leptin is like what would be 90, 90 to 100, 200 to 210, 210, to almost 210. Yeah, it's almost 30 years old. But ghrelin is only about 10 years old. So it is even newer. So these are, you know, very, very new um, findings. And as far as what are these hormones, where are they released from, what do they do, how can we help them, and so forth. So the research is very new. So that means you know, there's a, there's a lot of study being still being done, but there's also a lot that, that is not known about them. So um, what we do know about leptin is that it is a hormone that's produced and secreted by fat cells. It is, it enters the bloodstream and then it travels to the brain. So because so much of our eating and overeating stems from the brain, we have all this whole insulin factor coming into play, right? Which is what intermittent fasting deals with. Keep your insulin low, you'll eat less, you'll burn body fat and so forth. And then also so much in the brain. And that's what I'm in the middle of right now, which is compelling and interesting. I just absolutely love it. So um, it enters the bloodstream and it travels to the brain, delivering a message as to how much fat or fuel you have on hand. And um, it's also called the satiety hormone. It basically, uh, it tells your body to eat, or it tells your body that you don't need to. So it says, stop eating, I'm satisfied. Or, you know, keep eating, I'm not satisfied kind of thing. So ghrelin tells you that you're hungry, but leptin, on the other hand, tells you that you're not hungry anymore, that you're no longer full. And um, it also heavily influences metabolism. So in like really simplified terms, it's like a gas gauge telling you, you know, you're on E, so you need to fill up. That sounds very, very simple, and it sounds like we should all be thin. But there are a lot of problems with that, so let me keep going. Um, you can have high leptin levels, which means that your body really tells you at the right times that you're full. It tells you that you don't need to keep eating. It tells you that you have enough stored on your body already. Or you can have low. So when your leptin levels are low, you will eat more. And then when you've eaten enough, the leptin levels rise, tell your brain you're full. Uh, low leptin levels causes the brain to think that there's a famine, so your metabolism slows down. So when I say that it is affected, or it affects, heavily influences metabolism, that is one way that it influences metabolism. So it's, it's um, low, 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 we're hungry, we don't have enough fat stores, and then, um, your body says, oh no, there's a famine, and it slows the metabolism down. And this is why you, we hear so many warnings nowadays about VLCDs, very low calorie diets, and how they cause your body to think you're in a famine, and then they slow the metabolism down, hold on to fat, because the body is afraid that you're going to go into starvation. And if you remember right, just I don't even know, a dozen years ago or so, this was what everybody thought was happening whenever we would fast. So this is why people still say, oh no, you can't fast, you'll go into starvation mode, and your 
you'll ruin your metabolism and your body will go into starvation mode because you will not have eaten and your body will think you're starving your body will think there's a famine if you fast well now research has debunked all of that and now we know that just the opposite is true that it's actually eating a very low calorie diet of you know 800 900 700 1200 depending on your size a very low calorie diet for a long, 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 long period of time and eating very, very frequently that tells your body, oh, I'm starving, I need more food. It's not fasting. As a matter of fact, fasting, incre oh, pardon me, <coughs> excuse me, increases the metabolism by different studies anywhere between three and up to 14%. So if you have a lot of leptin sensitivity, you can actually increase your metabolism by up to 14% with intermittent fasting. Uh, so it's just the opposite is true. But you can see why, um, because when, our, when we go on these very low calorie diets, the body does get panicked, right? But with intermittent fasting, we're not on a very low calorie diet. We are just keeping our insulin low, 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 and then eating it all within a window of time. All right, so when you have an adequate leptin, uh, signal as well as response that's another problem that we're going to talk about but when you have an adequate leptin signal as well as response then your metabolism will go up because you're like oh there's plenty of food I need to burn it off I can use it all your body will you know that's kind of like your body's talking all right now um, there are a lot of places where leptin is compared to a thermostat and a lot of research and a lot of researchers materials and things like that. And I think that's a really, really good um, comparison. So I'm going to give that to you and then kind of follow that through with some of the ways that we can increase it. So um, leptin is like a thermostat on your wall. So when you think of um, uh, you know, a thermostat, you think of you set your thermostat at a certain level. So it's, it's winter around here, so everybody's talking about, you know, do you set your thermostat on 70, 72, where do you set your thermostat? So you set your thermostat on a certain level. So suppose you set it on 70. Ideally, if your thermostat is working and your heating and cooling system is working, or working, is working, system is, then you will, um, when your room gets below 70 in the winter, your heat will kick on right because your thermostat is set at 70 and you told that thermostat that if it's below 70 I need some heat all right and then the same thing happens in the summer you set it on 68 or 72 or whatever you want it on and when it gets hotter than that then your AC kicks on right then your air conditioning kicks on because you've told it if it gets uh, hotter than this I need some air conditioning it's gonna be too hot for me and uh, the thermostat model of leptin is known as something that is being homeostatic, homeostasis. Homeostasis, homeo means same, status, stasis means equilibrium. So it ideally your um, body leptin signals, they'll be in a homeostasis state all the time. Like, you know, your blood pressure, it, it's usually, unless you're sick, it's good. You know, your blood sugar, unless you're sick, it's bad. You know, there are, there, it's good. There are a lot of things in our body that are run in a homeostasis manner. And technically, our leptin is supposed to do that as well. But unfortunately, it doesn't because of resistance and sensitivity. So, uh, leptin sensitivity, we hear a lot Thank you. We hear a lot about um, insulin sensitivity, and we've come to understand that when the insulin is released, we don't we don't hear that we don't, and we uh, keep on eating more and more and more and raising our insulin higher and higher and higher. But uh, leptin sensitivity is actually goes hand in hand a lot of times with um, insulin sensitive in, insulin resistance insulin insensitivity. In means not. So we're talking about not being sensitive to it. So leptin insensitivity or leptin resistance is a bad thing, just like um, insulin resistance is a bad thing. So there are a lot of things that can lead to uh, leptin resistance. As I said, this is only 30, you know, 30 plus years of research on this topic of leptin. So, you know, there, there's 
there are always studies going and always research uh, about it taking place because it is so new. But there are some things that can cause us to be insulin sensitive, insulin res resistant. We resist leptin, leptin resistance. We resist it. One of those is being overweight, and um, which is a funny thing because. Leptin is actually supposed to work the other way. It's supposed to be such that if you have fat stores, leptin says, you know what, girl? <laughs> you do not need any more food. And it's supposed to like be released from the fat cells and tell your brain that you don't need any more food. But because we are leptin resistant, or we are insensitive, not sensitive to the signals, we don't hear it. So being overweight, while it's supposed to have leptin tell us more about how hungry, how we're, we don't need any more food, we don't hear it, so we are insensitive to it. When a body has a large amount of fat, the brain tunes leptin out. It becomes white noise to the brain. This slows the metabolism down and tells you to eat more. So even though you might have a lot of leptin, since you're resistant to it, you don't hear it. Now, I've also heard this example, and I think this is a fantastic example that most of us can identify with if we've ever had children, and that is uh, kids with headphones on. So we can have kids who have headphones on, they're listening to their music, you know, whatever, and uh, we can give them one instruction after another. <laughs> I have seven kids. I'm very experienced in this. So we can give our kids, you know, one instruction after another. Do this, do that. Did you do your homework? Da, 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 da. We can just keep going on and on and on. And the headphones might let a little bit of our instruction come through. So maybe they'll say, yeah, homework's fine. Okay, I'll get to my chores, you know, but they don't hear every detail. So they don't know, you know, that the groceries needed put away right away and you're running out the door and the milk is going to spoil. They only heard you say something about putting groceries away through their headphones. They didn't hear the entire instruction. They're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Lots of instructions given. Lots of words spoken because we speak a lot of words to our kids. And yet they hardly heard any of it because they had their headphones on. So this is what happens to us with leptin. We have all of this fat on our bodies. And leptin goes from our fat cells to our brain, and it tells our, the hypothalamus in the brain, it tells it, this girl has too much fat. Tell her to stop eating so much. But instead, we have the headphones on, or the brain has headphones on, and only hears bits and pieces of it. And that's why, I was just talking to my husband about this. We went into a restaurant and we didn't get an appetizer and we didn't get a drink and we didn't get a dessert and we shared an entree. And I said, do you remember years ago when we would come to this very same restaurant and we would get Mountain Dews and we would get an appetizer and we would each get a full rack of barbecue ribs with two side dishes. And then, even though I was very full, I would still get a dessert. And we just said, how in the world did we ever do that? We can't even do that now with our one meal a day. There's no possible way that we could eat that amount of food in one meal. And yet we used to. So how could... I be 100, 120 pounds overweight then, go into a restaurant and eat that much food, and at no time throughout that meal did my brain, my hypothalamus, get the signal, or maybe it got the signal, but at no time did I get the signal, honey, you need to stop. <laughs> I do not know how that happened, but it has to be because of the headphones. It has to be that we are not hearing the signals when they're released. Someone who is left and resistant requires more food than what is really needed in order to feel full. So we have this left and resistance and we need more food than what, than what we really do need 
because we're resistant to the signals from leptin. All right, so good news is we're on the right path to fix leptin resistance. My leptin resistance, so much better. My whole appetite correction is phenomenal after one year on intermittent fasting. I can't even believe it. I mean, I can still eat M&Ms and I know exactly which foods. I can be pretty full when I can still eat a candy bar. I know exactly which foods I can get by with eating even though I feel full because leptin doesn't respond to those foods and I know which ones they are. How terrible is that to know which ones and try to get them? No, it's because sometimes you just want chocolate, you know? So anyway, um, there are ways that we can increase our leptin or increase our sensitivity to it. So we actually have two ways to fix this because some of our problems will be based on the need to have our leptin increased. And some of our problems, more than likely for overweight individuals, will be the need to be able to hear our leptin signals, not as much as fixing, not as much as uh, having leptin be released more, but really just the, the ability to hear it, okay? The ability to take off those headphones, you know, and completely hear every instruction so the milk isn't spoiling out in the counter <laughs> while our kids are still in their bedrooms listening to music, right? Okay, so we do have some ways to increase leptin or the sensitivity to it. And uh, before I go into this, I just, I always feel compelled to say that so much of our weight issues throughout our lives, I mean, my husband and I, three, almost three decades of obesity, you know, you know, some of the times we were better than others, you know, we go up and down a little bit here and there. And one time I lost a hundred pounds, um, 25 years ago and put it on right back, put it right back on immediately because I was on a very low calorie diet. We all know we can't sustain VLCDs, right? Very low calorie diets. Like we can't do those for long. Uh, that, that requires the willpower and uh, the hypothalamus. The, it requires something that is not um, sustainable. Okay. So I always feel compelled at this point to say that weight loss is elusive many times, not because we're just fat slobs, you know? I mean, I was a great person before I lost, you know, the last 90 pounds that I've lost in the last several years. I was a great person. I was just as great as I am now, all right? I wasn't a fat, horrendous slob who just had no self-control, couldn't succeed in anything, you know? And I think we just get so bogged down in the fact that we can't lose weight that we don't see our successes in other areas or we feel like failures in other areas that really aren't true. And I think that at this point with leptin, the reason that that just speaks to me so much and I made this note in my notes about it is because we are fighting just deeply wired impulses, right? Like we didn't want to become leptin insensitive. We didn't want to become insulin insensitive. We didn't even know we were making ourselves do that, right? We didn't know. And when we went on those, all those very low calorie diets, we didn't know that we were lowering our metabolism with each one. We, we didn't know these things. So it's not like we're just fat, horrible people, right? We just didn't have the knowledge and the information and the tools to help us succeed. Our bodies were always working against us instead of for us. So that's why I love speaking about things that we can turn around in our bodies, um, the, especially things that we can turn around easily. I just recorded a five video series called the Calories In, Calories Out um, game. It's gonna be a free uh, five day video series that's gonna be released next week. And one, and, and the thing that I love most about it is it's a game board and you go around these squares and, and you either lose weight in inches or you gain weight or inches based on different things that you can do with your body. and the thing that I loved about it is at the end, so many of the 11 squares that you could lose or 11 squares that you could gain, so many of those things were simple fixes that I just didn't know. I didn't know water had that big of an effect. I didn't know sleep had that big of an effect. I didn't know protein had that big of an effect. I didn't know fiber had that big of an effect. And now I'm just, I'm excited to tell other people that because I didn't know it and I felt badly all that time that I couldn't lose weight. And so I want to tell other people so they don't have to feel badly, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people who feels bad for other people a lot. 
<laughs> um, you know, I think as just parenting seven kids, you just start to, to feel everything. But anyway, um, so that's why I'm so happy that we can find out ways to uh, increase our sensitivity to leptin. So the first way is fasting, all right? And uh, we talk about fasting in terms of lowering our insulin, right? And then fasting in all that time, and then our bodies will um, will go into fat burning and all those good things happening. But fasting is more than just lowering of insulin and more than just having a small eating window so we don't eat so much. There's so many things that come into play. And we talk about appetite correction a lot, and I've talked about that a lot on the broadcast. Appetite correction is actually like the perfect storm of all of these things lowered insulin, rising glucagon, um, lower ghrelin, rising leptin, raising our sensitivity to leptin. It is all of these things coming together as a perfect storm. That's what appetite correction really is. So when we say fasting causes appetite correction, what we're really saying is fasting is doing all these things to all these different hormones and bringing together a perfect storm for us. And I'm so grateful for that because all of that is happening for us during fasting. Again, need I say it again? While we do nothing. If you are a mom, you want to hear that, right? Because, or even just a woman who's not a mom, we do everything, right? We try to do everything. We try to make things happen for our families, for ourselves. Well, now this, these things are happening for us without us doing anything. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> we deserve that. All right. So, Besides all of those hormonal things, experts also believe that fasting helps control inflammation in the brain. And reducing that inflammation in the brain during fasting is going to help us hear leptin signals better. And if you've heard me talk about the cognitive benefits of intermittent fasting, which I do in the webinar as well as um, in the course, and I do it in some broadcasts as well, but if you've heard me talk about that, um, you will know uh, the cognitive benefits are Actually, there's so much research on these right now, and I'm so fascinated by them as I'm 55 years old. My husband is going to be 59 pretty soon. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he's going to be 59 pretty soon. I'm so fascinated by this because as I go into old, older, old, my older years, I want to know how I can ward off cognitive diseases, right? How can I keep my brain really healthy and strong? And how can I be able to speak and teach and write and create as I age? So I've been really fascinated by that. And there's so much research by it. But what's happening is that we are not having any food for a period of time. And that is putting us into ketosis. And there's so much research about ketosis leading to like reversing um, epilepsy, it's phenomenal. It's just so amazing. So as we fast, we're decreasing inflammation in our brains. And as we decrease inflammation in our brains, they're going to hear signals better. So actually just the simple act of fasting, going without food for 16 hours, 18 hours, whatever it might be, going without food for that period of time is going to potentially alter the inflammation in our brain which will cause us to hear the leptin signals better. All right, eating infrequently. So not eating very often. Uh, also, kind of the same thing helps us to hear leptin. Keeping insulin low. Insulin, I mentioned that insulin resistance goes hand in hand with leptin resistance. So they're usually found together. So as we keep our insulin low, that will help us. We're going to be, as we keep our insulin low through fasting, we're going to become more sensitive to insulin. We want to be sensitive to it. We want to hear its signals. The same thing will happen at the same time, kind of parallel journey there with leptin. All right, with fasting, our fullness signals from leptin work better near the end of the meal. Now, we've all heard so many uh, insights and so many instructions in how we can um, hear when we're full. So, you know, we've heard that all this advice. And the funny thing about it is I have, a, um, I have like 100 blog post article, blog article titles and ideas and broadcasts because my brain never stops. And now that I'm fasting, it really never stops. And so I just wrote one down just the other day that was this very thing. And that was um, something about, I can't remember the title, but it was really clever. It was <laughs> maybe mama was right or something. Anyway, it was about how, it's about how that those old fashioned remedies that people talked about, you know, 
some of those are just downright true, right? And this is this reminds me of it because what did our parents always say? You're not hungry, get a drink. Okay, right? It's not meal time. You're not hungry, get a drink. That was back in the day for those of us who are in the 50s, in our 50s, back in the day when we didn't eat 10 to 20 times in every 24 hour period. And that is research based. 10 to 20 times. That's counting cream in our coffee, a lick of a spoon, you know, so on and so forth. 10 to 20 times in 24 hours. So back in the days that we did not do that, our parents would say to us, drink some water, you'll be fine. How smart is that? All right. Um, so they also told us to eat slower, right? Eat slower. You know, you, you know, you're not you're not in a bar, you know, all, the, all those kind of things. But come to find out, and, and, and even like diet programs will tell us, get a smaller plate. You know, maybe you've been a Weight Watchers. Maybe you've already heard all of these things. But some of them are really true, right? And we need to listen to them because they're just smart, sage advice. And one of those is to slow down your eating so that you hear when you're full. You eat so fast you don't even know you're full. Well, come to find out, fasting actually helps us hear leptin um, uh, during the meal as opposed to the 20 minutes after. You know, some people say wait 20 minutes after your meal to see if you're hungry for dessert. Well, fasting actually helps us to hear our um, leptin signals um, faster because of the combination of appetite correction and everything that's happening. All right, lose weight. Um, I mentioned before that um, people with a lot of fat should have more leptin signals, but we don't hear them. People with lower weights have a better leptin release. So they hear leptin better, they get that release more clearly. So just even a lower weight. And so, you know, you think, well, what caused, like my leptin now, I feel like my appetite correction is, is just better right now than it has ever been in my entire life. And um, so, you know, is it because I'm, you know, 90 pounds lighter than I was 10 years ago? Is it because I'm, you know, 20 something pounds lighter than I was a year ago? Is it because, you know, my insulin is right, my glucagon is right, my ghrelin, my, you know, it's just a perfect storm. All right, eating inflammatory foods, I have that on there twice. Uh, Anti-inflammatory, I mean, don't eat inflammatory foods. Eating anti-inflammatory foods, I should probably get a list of those together. Um, eating real foods. All right, now, I talk about this a lot, and this is one reason why I recommend that you divide your eating window up into OMAD3. Right, we talk about I talk about that in the course a lot. I talk about that in um, on the blog a lot. I got a couple slideshows about it, and I also have some broadcasts about it. Um, but this is why, because leptin does not respond to certain things, and so now you're you know oh now here's when she's going to tell us that she can't we can't eat our favorite things, honey. My favorite thing is coming Saturday at my daughter-in-law's shower, and I'm definitely eating it. All right, and it, you know what it is? It is my daughter's chocolate chip cookies made with blue M&Ms because my grandbaby is a, new, a boy, made with blue M&Ms instead of chocolate chips. You know I love M&Ms. You put them in cookies, it's even better. All right, so I'm not going to get on your case here and tell you can't eat any special foods, all right? But the reason I say OMAD3, one meal a day divided by three, is because if you open your eating window, OMAD3, you open your eating window with a low carb or at the very least real, doesn't even have to be low carb. I like to do low carb because it keeps my cravings down, not because I'm afraid of carbs, because I'm not afraid of carbs. But open my eating window with a low carb or healthy snack, something real. Then a couple hours later, I have my one meal a day, whatever I want. And then if I still have room, I have my dessert. Sometimes I even keep my OMAD small enough because I know I want a dessert, especially if it's something that's kind of filling like ice cream or a cupcake or something like that, all right? But eating real foods more often, all the time, across the board, just trying to have a focus on real foods um, will cause our um, leptin signals to be heard better. When we eat too many calorie dense or highly processed foods, it can cause chemical changes in the brain that increase the desire to, to eat. I have so much information about that to bring you because I've been reading this hungry brain. Oh my word, it's so compelling. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to have M&M cookies. It just means 
I'm not having M&M cookies at the beginning of my meal. I'm not eating, I'm not grazing all day on M&M cookies. I, uh, it's going to be controlled. Eating high fiber foods. I've talked about that a lot, how the high fiber balloons up in your stomach and causes you to be able to eat less. All right, and that ballooning up in the stomach, remember this signal is going to come from the stomach it comes from the fat cells that's growing that comes from the stomach sorry about that but it's going to fill up the stomach and you're going to have less room for food high protein foods they increase the metabolism usually by 15 percent for to eat protein so protein foods we really really need to change it up get rid of some of the processed foods and have more protein um, but the protein is made up of amino acids which are the building blocks of protein and they act directly on the hypothalamus so protein is amazing i'm doing a lot of stuff on protein coming up so watch for that all right um and some people say that a refeed day or a cheat meal or a cheat day will trick the body into thinking it's being overfed and increase leptin i've also been doing a lot of research about this because i have a whole um broadcast or article, I don't know which I'm going to do, um, about cheat meals and cheat days as far as just like free for alls. And I really don't, and you guys have heard me say, do not use the word binge, do not use the word glutton, do not use the words pig out, do not use the word gorge, you know, because that is not, those are not healthy words. And they're not words that should be in our fasting vocabulary because fasting, fasting gives us control. It doesn't take, it doesn't, give us license it gives us control and so you can have anything you want but you're not going to pig out on it you're not going to gorge on it you're not going to um, uh, have a uh, pig out or whatever so um, I would say that there is some truth and I think that from what I've been researching that there's some truth to a, a higher calorie meal and it was really funny because when my husband was in the middle of, of I think now he's only losing about five or six pounds a month, but he was losing 10 a month. I mean, just month after month after month after month. And, and he, every Monday he would weigh and he'd say, I think I lose more weight when we have a family party on the weekend, which was about every weekend. And um, sure enough, every Monday after we would have a family party, he would weigh less than he did on a Monday that we did have a family party. This is this is scientific study right here. <laughs> so yeah, my research. And he said, it's because I'm eating more calories and I'm telling my body, my metabolism, that I need more calories. And I said, I think you're right. It was really, because he was so, I mean, he loves vegetables. And so he was, he's a, he's practically vegan all week long, plus egg yolks and peanut butter. And, um, and then on weekends, we just, we'd never, we would never say, I'm not going to get pizza with the kids or we'd never do the things I used to do, like eat the toppings only off of the pizza while all the kids were having pizza or bring this fat bomb instead of eating my grandson's birthday cake. Oh my word. I, we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. Um, but he would always, so, so the, Moral of the story is, I think there's something to be said for some party times, but I would not go off of fasting and have a cheat day because I feel like you can't recover from that many calories very easily. It would take a lot to recover from that. And then you'd have to just balance it out with so few calories later. It's just not worth it. However, a cheat meal, so to speak, and, I, and I'm going to reword this in my outline when I put it up because I do not like the word cheat meals, but a refeed meal or a higher calorie meal, controlled, planned, whatever. I usually don't eat the combination of flour and sugar uh, during the week because I know that that, I know you start to know things. You start to know like I can get by with a Dove candy bar, but give me a cupcake and I'm done for right? As far as my cravings and things. So you start to know that. So I don't usually have the combination of flour and sugar during the week. If I want anything sweet, I will either have like low sugar jelly on my sprouted wheat bread or something like that, or peanut butter or something, or, or I will have sugar like M&Ms or something like that. I don't usually have the combination of the two, but then whenever we have a party, I do. And, um, I think that having 
a time where you do have more calories, uh, especially if you're starting to get too low during the week, can help. You can try it out and see. Next one is don't drink calories. Leptin does not recognize drinks. And I've talked about this before too. Some of these I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but how you can go into a restaurant and you can get uh, you know, a big burger and a large fry and you can be full with that, especially if you just have, you know, you just have water with it or whatever, or maybe a Zevia or whatever. Some people still drink diet sodas. And you can have that, or you can add. 32 ounces of Pepsi to it and not feel any different after you do that than you would if you'd had water with it. Because 32 ounces of Pepsi, how does that go? 12 ounces is 240, so 246, two, probably over 600 calories of pop. And yet you felt no differently than if you had had water with that meal in terms of your fullness. It's because leptin does not recognize uh, liquid calories. All right, sleep. Um, I have a lot of some of the last broadcasts, I want to say 31, 32, and 33 are about ghrelin and sleep and some of those things. So catch those again uh, because sleep plays a huge role in leptin release and leptin sensitivity. Another thing that causes us not to hear leptin signals is something that I talked about in um, episode 32 or 33, and that is high cortisol levels. And uh, cortisol is our stress hormone. And yes, we, we women have a lot of cortisol. Unfortunately, it wreaks havoc on the metabolism as well as on our satiety signals. And that's why people say, I'm stress eating. I can't stop overeating. I can't stop stress eating, right? And that's why people... Um, will be actually physically more hungry when they're stressed. It's not, they're not just making it up. And they will have way more cravings when they are stressed. So um, I've really, after I did the last couple of episodes, 32 and 33, so I started about a month ago um, with different relaxation techniques, really working on my sleep hygiene, um, just because Getting my stress level down, getting my stress, uh, my sleep in, getting my water in, uh, eating more protein, taking fiber supplement, um, sleep, water. These things are things that hardly take any extra effort whatsoever. And yet they can have a few huge effect on our weight loss efforts. So I figure if something is almost, free, fasting is free. No effort, no time charge, no finance charge. You know, 60 or 70 bucks, you can take my course and learn it. And you know, how many people spend way more than that each week? I used to spend more than $60 a week on specialty foods. Seriously. One week of what you can, anyway. But that's neither here nor there about the course. What I'm trying to say here is that the things that are free in cost, in time, and almost free in effort are things that we can do for ourselves right away and one of those is sleeping because sleeping helps our lower our cortisol level and relaxation techniques yoga is one of the best things for uh, lowering cortisol if you don't feel comfortable doing yoga or you don't want to do yoga there is a lot of research about ways to lower cortisol and one of them was really interesting this is i'm going to run out of time but this was a really funny study and it was um where they took women into a room and they piped in instrumental music for five minutes. So five minutes of instrumental music only. And um, they, uh, no, no words, and they um, taught them deep breathing exercises before they went in. So for five minutes, they listened to instrumental music and they did deep breathing, uh, deep breathing patterns. And it lowered their cortisol by 50% in five minutes. The minute they took it to six minutes, it was no longer effective. Can you guess why? It's because once it got over five minutes, they could not keep their mind from doing their mental to-do list. <laughs> How typical is that of us, right? So the moral of the story is we can lower our cortisol. We should lower our cortisol. Um, and not, reduce, not, re, uh, not reducing calories too low. Okay, I talked about it a little bit ago. Reducing calories too low tells us we're starving, puts us in famine mode, and so forth. 
So that is the scoop on leptin. I have a lot more to say about uh, leptin in the brain, but that's going to have to be another time. I have a lot more to say about different types of food and their effect on the brain and so forth. Um, and, oh, I forgot. I always call, I call leptin, this is from my course. I call, this is my growling, growling, growling gremlin. But I call leptin our leveling leptin leprechaun. Isn't he so cute? My tech, my tech girl's amazing. All right, so that is all I have today for leptin. But I am going to talk for a few minutes about a Flexus product. So you can stay on or you can jump off. You won't offend me. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all. If you want to know more about healthy supplementation, stay on. I'm going to tell you about a metabolism boosting product that um, Plexus uh, carries. And if you don't want to, I'll see you in the next broadcast or at DonnaReach.com, in the webinar, on my YouTube channel, at iTunes, wherever you might find me. Thanks a lot for joining me. Plexus Boost is what I'm going to talk about now. I've talked a lot about Plexus Slim, the pink drink. You shake it up. It lowers your blood sugar. It does a lot of things that fasting will do for us. Um, and it also has Garcinia Cambogia and uh, green tea and um, uh, um, chromium, lots of things. It's really, it's all, all Plexus products are plant-based. All right, so I've talked a lot about that. So you can catch some of the previous broadcasts where I talked about the two different Plexus Slims. I've also talked about one, I've talked about both of them, but I've talked a lot about one of our metabolism boosters, and that is called Accelerator. An Accelerator is a metabolism booster and an appetite suppressant. Again, they're all plant-based, so they're all made out of plants, um, and they're all natural. There are no um, artificial ingredients. Even the colors and the flavors, the flavorings and slim and everything are natural. But the second, we actually have two metabolism boosters. One is the accelerator, and the second one is called Boost. And um, the reason we have two is because um, uh, the first one, Plexus um, Accelerator, has a natural antidepressant property. It has 5-HTP, which is an appetite suppressant um, that's really popular and uh, really proven in a lot of studies to work, but that 5-HTP is also an antidepressant. So you're not supposed to take 5-HTP by itself or 5-HTP in accelerator when you are on antidepressants because you'll be getting like a double, you know, one will be plant-based and natural, but you'll be getting two forms of antidepressants at the same time. So that is why they also have Boost. So Boost is another, is their other um, plant-based appetite suppressant. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ingredients. First of all, it's gluten-free, vegetarian, um, has green tea in it, has caffeine. So uh, I alternate between Accelerator and Boost. I go back and forth. I might use Accelerator for a couple months, and then I use Boost for a couple months. Um, I use it, both of them as my caffeine pills because I don't drink coffee. I don't drink tea. Um, I don't drink cocoa. I don't drink anything with caffeine at all, actually, because I can't drink Diet Coke anymore either because of my restless legs. So, um, uh, and also because it's not good for you. Um, but, uh, so I use this as my caffeine pill because each accelerator and each boost capsule has the equivalent of one cup of coffee. So I take two accelerators or two boosts first thing in the morning before I go to work out. And then I have that caffeine and because caffeine has that half life that lives a long time, half of it lives long, 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 long time. I can't take any caffeine in the afternoons. So I do have to take my two accelerators or my two boosts in the morning. And that's in place of any coffee or any kind of um, caffeinated drink. And that really helps me during my fast too. All right. So I'm going to tell you about the ingredients, some of the ingredients here in boost. So one of them is called Caroluma Fimbriata. And this is my favorite. I think it's my favorite. I like a lot of the ingredients in the Plexus products, but this is one of my favorite ingredients in all the Plexus products because of this reason. It is an edible cactus eaten by tribesmen in North Africa and Indi India during long hunting expeditions to ward off hunger and to help ancient people survive during times of famine. Sounds like the perfect ingredient for fasters, right? I love it that it was an actual plant that they carried in their loincloth. I don't know. <laughs> I don't 
don't even know. I'm not a history person. My son would die if he heard me talking anything about history. I'm always like, is this really true about this? Every time I hear something, I'm like texting my son. Is this really true about this tribe? Could this really have happened with this tribe? Anytime I'm studying anything about appetite, uh, hunger, fasting, um, paleo, how we used to eat, anything, I always refer, re text it to one of my sons. And he's always like, Mom, that couldn't have happened. I'm like, how do I know that couldn't have happened? <laughs> I love that kid. Anyway, he's patient with me. He's my firstborn, so he learned how to be very patient with me. All right, so it has a thermic effect for fat burning, this Caroluma fimbriata. So it makes you feel, it satisfies your appetite. So you can keep on running and chasing after that wild buffalo for hours and hours and hours without any stops for food or without any stops at the drive through And it um, has a thermic effect for fat burning. So it raises your core temperature to help you melt fat. Because of that, some people use Boost as a pre-workout. So I actually have been on Accelerator for the whole time I've been doing these. I've been doing like st more strength training in the mornings down at the Y. And I've been using um, Accelerator during this all this time. So I'm actually just ordered Boost this week. And I can't wait to take it before I work out because a lot of people do use it um, for that purpose as well. It has green tea extract, which is, again, equivalent to one cup of coffee of natural caffeine. And that helps boost the metabolism and is great for those who don't want to drink coffee, those who want natural energy. Um, of course, you can always drink um, black coffee. You can drink black tea. You can drink green tea. Um, you can do some of these things to get the caffeine from the actual source, too. All right. And then it has, oh, man, I was going to look up how to say this, hygienamine. Ha! I did it right. Hygienamine. Four syllables. I like it. Hygienamine. It is sourced from tangerine peel and, peel and lotus seed and gives energy. Energy is why it's called boost in part. It's also because it boosts your metabolism. It also has bioavailable B vitamins. So whereas Accelerator was an, an, an antidepressant, had antidepressant properties, boost does too, but in the form of B vitamins. So it's not the same as, you know, taking a specific like that 5-HTP, taking that specifically that lowers, um, that increases serotonin. And you don't want the, too many of those things going on all at the same time. But the bioavailable B vitamins that are in boost are going to also help with nerve, anxiety, depression, and uh, things like that. Uh, niacin, B6, B12, at pretty high percentages. And also bioavailable, that's really important. You, it's not gonna be a vitamin that you cannot, that, won't, that you cannot um, absorb. You're gonna be able to absorb it. And then chromium, which is another natural appetite suppressant. It's found in like, you'd have to have like 20 servings of broccoli or something like that. All right, so um, clinical studies with Boost have shown significant decrease in excessive hunger. So Accelerator and Boost, very similar. Accelerator, Accelerator has the, they both have the same caffeine, the green tea and all that. Um, I think they both have chromium. Accelerator has the 5-HTP, uh, which is an antidepressant. Um, Boost has the Caroluma fimbriata. Uh, which gives a thermic effect. So helping you, when I say a thermic effect, like the thermic effect of protein or something, I'm talking about um, the metabolism boosting power that causes you to, uh, like will increase your metabolism. Like when you work out, you're gonna feel hotter and you're going to feel that thermic effect from it. So that's all I have from for you today from Plexus. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode and that it's been helpful. And if I learn anything that, can't contradict something else that I learned earlier, I will tell you. I will bring that to you because I'm not a know-it-all and I don't know it all. I am learning all along the way, hopefully just a few steps ahead of you so that I can uh, give you the information that you're looking for in easier to understand terms and with examples and with um, uh, analogies and things that kind of make it a little bit clearer than, than uh, maybe uh, uh, from a medical source. Those are great. And that's where I learn too, but hopefully I can help you learn here as well. Thank you for joining me for leptin and for plexus boost. I'll see you next time.